Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us here today. We're going to give everyone about 30 seconds to get in the room. We have a little bit of a different format today. So I can't see everyone's faces uh, because we have a Zoom webinar, but we're really excited to have Josh here with us. We'll introduce him in a second, but we're just going to give people a few moments uh, to pile in. So welcome, everyone. Again, happy Friday. Hope it's beautiful wherever you are and uh, that you have some pretty awesome plans for the weekend. Sonsi, it's great too seeing those attending numbers keep on going up. I feel like yeah. you're close to the invite total right here. <laughs> you know, you always wonder uh, having uh, get togethers at the end of the month, uh, if that's a good thing, people like that, they're getting ready for the, the new month, or if it's sort of a mad rush at the end, just trying to get everything in. So the last day of the month and a Friday at lunchtime. So yeah, there's some, uh, there's some calendar battles with this one. I know, I know. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah, the chat is, is uh, you guys can certainly chat in. <laughs> Steven. Hey, Minta, big fans. Hey, Jenna. Okay. All right, we're still seeing people join, um, but we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Hey, Tony, welcome, welcome. Okay, so again, it's Friday. We're getting ready for the weekend. Thank you for joining us. We're excited about the topic that we have uh, for everyone today. Uh, so a little bit about the topic. Josh and I met only a few short weeks ago over LinkedIn. I think that's the power of LinkedIn as a networking platform and jumped on a call, met each other, and I was just hugely interested in the topic at hand, which was a lot about change and how do we manage change. We're all going through a lot of it personally, professionally, with our peers, uh, with our customer success managers, or the team that we manage, uh, with our family, and a lot of different levels. And uh, he shared a lot about his sort of formula to making change a powerful and positive thing. Uh, so we can harness that and use that to, not only to our advantage, but help make us better people, um, better managers, and to be able to better work with our customers. So I thought no better place to share that information than with our Humans of Customer Success community. A little bit about our community, for those of you that are joining for the first time, we meet on the last Friday of every month for about an hour at noon. Um, we also have an online forum where we chat, and it's all about sharing advice, sharing tips, asking for recommendations, all mostly focused on the human aspect of customer success. Um, and uh, how do we how do we have quality interactions with our customers, um, and how does that make us better with ensuring that they're successful overall? So that's the theme here. A little bit about Koala. Uh, so we essentially host or nurture this community. Uh, we are the only human first customer success platform and we measure important quantitative and qualitative metrics to help give our customers a more predictive view of customer health. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh. Welcome Caroline, welcome, welcome Tarek, I love seeing people chat in. Um, he's gonna talk a little bit more about himself, set some, um, like a little bit of housekeeping on how we're gonna keep this interactive. And a short note on that, we're doing a webinar today for the very first time. Usually we do a Zoom meeting. So if you have thoughts on that, let us know. Uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Josh. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited. I've heard this presentation before. I learned something, something new each time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. No, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Sansi. And I think even more so, if you wanna know my excitement, I'm wearing a college shirt. Like at the end of the day, I feel since we've all went mostly remote, I can't remember the last time I actually put on a college shirt, so I'm rocking it to make sure that you see uh, my energy when we go through this. So to everyone that is out there and on, um, and thank you, Matt and Tony, uh, for those comments. Yes, I'm actually wearing a pair of pants too. It's not even shorts. I went the whole nine yards with this dynamic. I'm in, and I hope you guys are in as well. So over the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, I wanna make sure that it was called a discussion um, session for a reason. So there's gonna be moments when we open up through chat to have a dialogue. So depending upon some of the feedback to the questions I might have put out there, I might pick on someone to actually address it and we'll have a dialogue. So it's not just the voice that you're hearing right now communicating, but it's the peers. And it, cause this session is truly about ourselves and that's an important part of what we're doing. So I'm gonna kick us off. So please use 
the chat functionality when we have some components of questions. But today's time, it's really about making change positive and powerful, right? This session is not about how do we stop change from happening. That's a fantasy land, right? We can't actually do that. But we can take change moments that we've all experienced and try to maximize what we actually get through it. And some of those moments might be positive, some of those might be negative, but in either regard, if we take a strong look at self and try to better understand what makes us satisfied in the work that we do and how we motivate or how we become motivated to achieve anything, all of a sudden we can take those things when things become different and try to get something more out of it. So that's the hope today, that you can take some practical um, action steps from what we share and you can apply them to the teams you lead, to the customers you serve, or even just to your own interactions with people that you deal with on an ongoing basis. So me, background, um, why am I here doing this? I have about 15 years of marketing and sales experience. Uh, I listed some of the companies I've worked for, and if you look for the theme amongst all my roles, and I didn't include some of the business development or account management positions I was in, um, often the theme in what I do happens to be the tie to bringing different talent together. How do you solve a question, not with one person, but with a team of talent? And the, uh, the resulting impact is often, how do you create healthier accounts? So considering this is a team of customer success folks, I feel like the idea of healthier accounts is an important component that you guys deal with on an ongoing basis. In addition, I've been teaching for almost a decade at Boston College, class on organizational behavior. So as a marketer or sales rep or a sales leader, I've actually been teaching organizational behavior, not marketing, because of that theme that I shared in a lot of my work, where I gravitate towards my best work happens to be with others. And I'm hoping to bring some of those concepts to life. And in fact, what you're seeing today is a tailored, tightened version of something that came through my own network. As a teacher, I found bringing in experts to help bring to life theoretical or academic concepts has made a strong impact on resonating these theories to students. And one of those folks who I've known for a long time actually leads a customer success team, and he was doing a session on team motivation. Dan shared, hey, the principles you're sharing that I'm watching you bring to life to your students are so relevant to the teams I lead. I'd love to find a way for you to craft this and do a full workshop, two to three hours, with my teams to bring this to life because I think it'll make them happier in their work, more successful with what they do. So what you're seeing is a tailored version of that, but it was fundamentally designed for the teams that you guys lead or the roles that you actually have. So I appreciate being here and I'm happy to take any questions after. But what are we gonna to cover today, right? What's our agenda? Three key concepts, right? The idea of job satisfaction. We're gonna define it, I'm gonna give you an example and I'm gonna give you an exercise. We're also gonna talk about a motivational theory that stands out most to me that we've likely all experienced as individuals. And then we're gonna end with a change management principle that is anyone that's worked for any organization that said we're changing, um, we've seen the steps that we often take in, pa in path, but how do we take those steps and actually apply them to situations that we're going through as individuals? Why? Because these key concepts aren't about someone else, they're about ourselves. So we're going to look at them from two different ways. First way is internal, right? The reflection that we see in the mirror. We're going to look at it from that lens. Number two, we're going to look at it from the teams that we lead and the customers we serve because these factors or these situations, they're experiencing them um, as well. And we're gonna do this all under one theme. That's how we're gonna tighten this up together. And that theme is by understanding personal motivations, by understanding personal motivations and factors that lead to professional satisfaction in ourselves, our teams, and our customers. We can make change, whether a small change or a dramatic change, like we're all living through in a pandemic state, a positive and powerful ongoing process. And my hope is you see that, you get something that you can apply to it and it becomes meaningful in your own life, in your work. So our approach, how are we gonna do each one of these concepts? We're gonna look at it from a lens of you, right? Person that's most important to us when we look in the mirror. We're also gonna look at it from maybe teams you lead and customers you serve. Each one of these examples or each one of these concepts, I'm gonna give a personal example because we're humans here. Part of the reason why Sansi and I connected is to bring a human perspective to this. Let's make it real. So I'll share, I'll get transparent, I'll get a little vulnerable, and I hope you guys do it, whether it's through chat with everyone else or through yourself in terms of keeping this stuff real. So I'll give you a personal example. I'll root it in a theory by someone way smarter than me, and then I'll give you an exercise to bring it to life. Remember, each one of these are done typically over a longer period of time, but we can tighten it up, and maybe it's work that you can do post-session as well. So I share the backdrop on who I am in terms of what I've been doing in my career and my work. 
but I've yet to meet anyone that's fundamentally defined what's on their resume or by the bullet points in a job responsibility they do, right? We are more accurately defined by how we look at work, how we experience life, and the family and friends that craft who we are as individuals. So I want each of you, as we go through these topics, to forget what's on your resume or to forget what's in the bullet points of your job as is, and be comfortable looking through the lens of working, living, and the people that we care about. And to do that, because each one of these exercises, these concepts come, uh, come to life, I want to be a little transparent to give you who I really am, rather than just 15 years of doing X and 10 years of teaching. So for me, most recently, about three years ago, I was asked by a VP of B2B marketing to address a challenge, a challenge that I would argue many of you in the work that you do know better than anyone else. How do we create a healthier accounts? Why aren't our accounts rampant? Why aren't our accounts being compliant to the program that we created? I was lucky enough as a marketer to design a program, a function of the business, to try to address that. So to take something from a business question and to build it out along the lines of saying, how do we look at unique accounts? How do we better understand what's taking place within those accounts? How do we craft the right narrative through marketing content to accomplish what we're aiming for? And how do we nurture those folks to drive them inbound to a seller who can help convert, right? That experience is probably something many of you do on an ongoing basis. I was lucky enough to create that from a question to a team of five people. And yes, I can, I can do math. There are four people in that photo. There was one more, but as a manager or a leader, probably not the best team outing when you have someone eight months pregnant to go to a bar. Just gonna level that down, good lesson. But there's four of us in this case. And in fact, this was the last week before we went completely remote. So to think of any of those folks that are out here that have the opportunity to create a function of a team from a simple business question, that ability to craft and mold Play-Doh is something that's core to who I am as an individual. That ride from an idea all the way to something powerful, a function that's supported within the business is fulfilling to me. But life also happens, right? And at the end of June, the reality was the way the business at Staples that I was working on was operating, when no longer people are going to offices, changed, right? That's an important change I think many of us have gone through. So I'm no longer there, but does the experience of what I did not matter? Of course it does. And it's core to who I am, that ability to create something from nothing. That's part of what drives me as a professional. Good relationships that I each talk to those folks you see in this photo today. Even myself, occasionally I do do some self-talk. But the point here is that even in lessons of challenge, we can learn things about ourselves if we're willing to sit down and do that reflection. So there's a work example. At the same time, there's also life examples. So I still attempt, and this is from spring of 2019 when you could do these types of activities. For the past 20 years since I was 18, I've been participating in men's league or rec basketball, right? And if you asked me 20 years ago, I said, the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't want to give up my high school experience because I can never play at a greater level, right? I, those aspirations weren't ever going to come to fruition for me. At the same time, if you said why I'm doing it, it's because I want to compete with these people. Yeah, you know, when I look at that photo right there, the 10 of us, if I can do good math, I think that's actually nine of us. Yes, I can add. There's one missing from that photo, right? They didn't play with me when I was 18 years old. A lot of these folks have come up through walks of life, whether it's friend of a friend, whether a colleague. I'm looking at multiple people in that photo that I met through multiple different roles and jobs, and even someone that I picked up just playing Saturday morning basketball. At the same time, my enjoyment of playing once a week is still clear. So even if the people have changed, the experience of doing something with others that I enjoy is core to who I am. And understanding that is an important way that we say when things are different, how do we come back to good? In addition, if I go back five years ago and someone said you're going to be a parent, I would say not happening, right? That's not my path. Yet at the same time, Skylar and River, my son and my daughter, or my daughter and my son, if I'm keeping consistent there, right, are now core to who I am as an individual. And they drive me to operate in a certain way that I want to make sure that they are clear that the things that I do matter to them. And I want to leave them with lessons that stand out. And thank you guys for continuing to chat. Now I will catch up with some of those ones as we get to a moment. So there's some life dynamics, right? In addition, there's a picture of my mother and I from my wedding, right? So my mother, post my parents getting divorced when I was six, really in many ways crafted who I am as a person. She was a teacher, likely why I teach. She was someone that gave a lot of herself to the people that she cared about. And she was meaningful for me as I think about my life and my development. Yet at the same time, she passed in 2019 at 60, 62. 
right? So many of us have suffered loss that's core to who we are. And that's not something that we would ever choose to experience. Yet at the same time, can what that person meant to us and what we went through and what we were challenged with become important for the decisions that we make going forward? And lucky enough, I had one of those opportunities. Within my prior employer, I had an opportunity to take more compensation, a better title, and a new challenge on. Yet timing for me, my wife wanted to start her own practice, and she was leaving the organization that she was working for. And the last words that my mother said to me um, before she passed was that she was proud to raise a son that would give his all to the people he cared about before anything else. And to help my wife stand up her business made more sense for who I am as an individual to forsake the opportunity to have better title and more pay. And I'm sure many of us have the lessons that we've learned through dramatic or traumatic change that stay with us. So these are three examples that don't ever come to life in the job responsibilities that we have or essentially the bullet points in what we're doing. Yet, they are core to at least the way that I look at myself. And what I hope is that by you guys looking at your work, your life, and those that you love, you can bring to life some of these moments to better understand yourself. So we're going to do that now. And so I ask everyone, whether you use the chat functionality because you're willing to potentially get called on to be unmuted by me to have a dialogue about it, or you take out a piece of paper because you still enjoy writing with a pen and paper, or you open up a Word document, you use your phone, however you decide to put down notes. I want you to think over the past couple of years the, and think about some changes that you've gone through as, as an individual, right? List three examples of significant change. And if you want the shortcut answer here, it's pandemic life, right? Like we've all been dramatically impacted by that. But you can get a little bit deeper and try to list other things that you've gone through. So I want everyone to take the opportunity to think through that change that you've gone through. It can be longer than recent if you choose to do that as well. Meaningful change that you've experienced as an individual, right? There's three examples of situations you've gone through that forced you to change is probably a better way to frame that statement. If you're comfortable enough putting it in chat, I'll likely call you out. I'll give you another 30 seconds to not hear the sound of my voice to, um, to write it down. Chelsea got married. Tony just wants to talk to me. That's always a good thing. There you go. Sickness with mom. Chelsea, I certainly understand that one. Promotions, right? These are, this is a great, great example. This is not all negative, right? These things are, can be positive as well. Fully remote, new home, divorced, learn from children. I love this. Daryl, I'm going to make it as clear as possible. Daryl, I'm going to see if I can unmute you because, Daryl, you and I don't have a relationship. I feel some of these other folks I do know. So I'm going to try to make this as organic as possible. So let's see if I can find Daryl. Daryl, you might either love or hate me. We could be either way. Allow to talk. Daryl, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, can you hear me? Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being willing to share your thoughts. And this is our first introduction to each other as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Well, I want to actually do a pause. Let's do a, a get promoted example. So when you got promoted, I'm going to ask you just your initial feelings and reactions and thoughts. Because I think many of us have also had that opportunity when we've gotten promoted, so it re uh, resonates with others. Yeah, so um, I think it definitely, it is a positive, but what's been interesting for me is, um, and I've spoken with Sansi about this quite a bit, I'm definitely a bit overwhelmed in the new role, um, feeling a little bit like I'm on my own island here, just with the new responsibilities and, and so on and so forth. I'm obviously um, super excited about it, but it, it is overwhelming. It's just a change can be difficult. And obviously, since we've all been going through a whole bit of change with the happenings of this year, um, yep. you know, I think this is, this is something that adds a little bit to that stress. I'm obviously proud of myself, but at the same time, I, I definitely feel like I've, you know, I'm a bit overwhelmed in my new responsibilities. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and that's certainly understandable. I think even yeah. when great things happen to us, right? The feeling of this being different can also often feel like there's a weight on our shoulders that we're not sure how to get off. Exactly. So, awesome example. So in your mind, what's getting you through this? Like, how are you dealing with that feeling of a good burden, right? Many of us are often dealing with a, a challenging burden, but this is a good sure. burden. How are you dealing with it? Um, leveraging my friends, talking to people, um, golfing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, 
yeah, so that's it's my weekend activity. Um, but it's you know it, trying to keep my my head mentally clear as well um, is not easy. It's just you know juggling lots of personal things as well has been difficult. You know, with 2019 and of course the changes in 2020, but. I think one of the, the best things that we can all do as a whole is really to try to remain positive because a true believer in the fact that, you know, um, being positive tends to have a very positive influence back toward us because we make the environment around us more of a positive environment to interact with. Yeah. I think the example, even as you shared, the, we only see through our own, our own eyes. So at the end of the day, if we can see something positive, even through any challenges or great situations, that often becomes reflected in those that surround us. So I think it's a great example. And I would argue many of the folks on this call probably have seen the same thing. Even in good situations, what gets us through is either the relationships we have, whether you're a big circle person and you need a lot of them, or you're someone that might have a tighter circle and you maybe need one to two folks. And also some type of ongoing physical activity that breaks us from whatever we were doing prior. So awesome example. And your mind, this is one of my favorite questions. I know you're going through the situation right now. Will there, ever, will there be like a moment in time when you're like, I'm good, like I've made it through it. And anything come up in your mind to go, this might be the moment that I'm like, I, I know I've dealt with it and I'm good. That burden doesn't feel the same way it does before. Anything come up in your mind? Um, I would say the anxiety would probably lessen a little bit be easier to you know attack the day i think yeah. um and just kind of feel more comfortable in the whole newness of the situation that i'm in so no it's a perfect answer like what we're feeling even if it's the most pressured moment or most hurtful moment or most exciting moment at some point it does go away i ask everyone to think about their biggest challenge in january whether it was once again work whether it was life whether it was family the biggest challenge that you had in January, in many ways, I would argue over the past six months, that thing which might have eaten away at your time, your mind, and everything else, might no longer carry the same weight that it does today. There might be other things you're dealing with. Or if we want to go to the, the flip side, and I think back to my dynamic with losing my mom, that doesn't mean I don't have sorrow, right? That's not to say it ever goes away completely. But is it on my mind in the same exact way? And have I learned lessons that I can apply through that experience? And so at the end of the day, there's very few things that we don't get through as individuals, even if in the moment it feels like it's incredibly overwhelming. So to do this, I want us to transition to the next topic. And thank you, Daryl, for participating. I appreciate Absolutely. it. I'm going to put you back on mute here, but there's other opportunities for other attendees to participate with. So let's continue down the path to say um, the academic part of this, and I'll quickly reference because I think it is important when we think outside of ourselves to maybe the teams that we lead or the customers that we support. I want to pick two of these moments. Um, these are key factors that often come up consistently when we say what causes challenges to overcome any type of moment of significant change. Maybe you're dealing with um, motivating the teams that you lead, right? I would argue the fear of the unknown is one of the biggest things that at least for me has come up in my life to say, I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. It's tough for me to give fully to today. Maybe as a leader of teams, when you say this is where we need to be and this is what we're all going through, that fear of unknown is causing someone to say, I'm concerned with what I'm doing next. Because that's the truth. And maybe it's a customer that you're supporting. And I can think that so many conversations I've had with folks that are selling some level of software, selling some level of product, or selling some level of a relationship, and the reality of how that business is constructed, that people are recentering on a few core activities. So if you've provided something that's net new to the business, even all those moments of efficiencies and improvements that you could be providing, if the business is recentering, and this would fall under group inertia, right? The group, the client, the people are recentering on something, that's a tough challenge to overcome. And I argue how we do that is better understanding triggers inside of ourselves that create satisfaction or happiness with the work that we do. So that leads us to our core first concept, right? That was introduction to change and we'll close that change. But the idea of job satisfaction, by definition, it's a positive feeling about the job resulting from an evaluation of its characteristics, right? And I want us to think about this because it's important. If you are someone that is not gonna see this as a, I'm gonna give the flip side of the coin of, of job dissatisfaction. So we're gonna hit both angles. Someone that gets this concept immediately, and someone might, that might not believe in it. 
Normally when I do this session, we also get into psychological empowerment as well as job involvement. Two other parameters around how do you get people to get more out of their work because it fuels them as individuals. And that's an important part when we're dealing with any type of change because understanding those layers helps us go through it. Once again, doesn't take away the pain, the challenges, the worry, but allows us to come out on the other side of that in a better state that we were before. So what I have listed up here that I hope you guys can help me is 21 factors. And if you said, what's the science behind 21 factors? 21 is a good number. You can do this with five factors. You can do this with 100. Normally, this is a 15 to 30 minute exercise when we lay out these principles and we ask people to prioritize them. What we're doing in this case, I'm going to ask you to pick the top three. Take out that same notepad, use the chat functionality, type into your phone. I want you to rank the top three that you see on this list. And maybe even highlight the one that you would say is the least important to your own satisfaction. Right? Exercise, job satisfaction, an evaluation of characteristics. These are characteristics. If you would say, what's most important to make you satisfied in your work, what would you put number one? That's an important part of this. And I want to be clear. Go back to my son and daughter here. This is not saying you love both your kids equally, right? I can't do that. I'm sorry, River. You know what? I'm going to put your sister in front of you. Just the nature of who I am. I wouldn't tell them that. But this practice is about prioritizing one versus two. So go back to the listing and list out what would be your most important thing to keep you satisfied in your job. Right? There's no right or wrong answer. I would have historically said compensation all throughout my experience. And maybe management recognition of a job well done. I want to make more money and I want someone to tell me I'm great at it. Yet at the same time, when I really think through the decisions I've made over 15 to 20 years of working, that is really the things that come up important. So if I think today what would be most important, I shared some of those examples, right? The ability to control the outcome of what I'm building, the people that I get to work with, right? The communication opportunity about how this comes to life more than just one function and one team, right? Flexibility to handle work-life dynamics. Maybe the variety of itself, compensation starts moving further down the list. But that's not to say compensation is bad. That's simply to say for me, there's some honest self-reflection. So I'm going to pick on someone. We're going to do the same thing again. So put it into chat if you're comfortable having a conversation. I'm going to use Tyler. Tyler, so we're going to see if I can bring you out here. Let's go to participants. And we go to Tyler. Tyler, can you hear me? I should say. Uh, yes, Joshua. There we go. And hear me was the wrong way to ask the question because, yes, you could hear me. Could I hear you is the better way to look at it. So, <laughs> so tell me your, uh, your top three when you think about looking at this list. How would you rank them? What would you put first, second, and third is most important to keep you satisfied in your work? Uh, I marked down flexibility, opportunities to use my skills, and pay. Um, I... I I recently switched careers away from uh, teaching uh, in a classroom, in a public school classroom. Um, I, I did not enjoy the, the, the co-located environment. Um, I, I wanted to switch from being a technology-oriented educator to becoming an education-oriented technologist. And so I, I wanted to be able to continue to be a helper and use my skills that, that, that I've got, but kind of wanted to switch which was primary and which was the modifier. And that's related to me wanting to, to, to get paid, right? Because yeah. unfortunately, unfortunately, our society doesn't value uh, the, the, the technology-oriented educator nearly as much as it values the education-oriented technologist. So um, yeah. I, I, th those are the things that were most important to me. I think it's a great example. So let's go back in time. How, uh, how recently did you make that career change? Uh, last June. Last June. So if we maybe go back three years ago, would you argue the things that would make you satisfied in your job likely might have been a, a little bit different? Clearly, the experience kind of showed you I got to find change in what I'm doing. I would argue the teaching component to me immediately ties to compensation. <laughs> like yep. I could see that yep. dynamic. But if you went back maybe two years before you decided that, would, what, how do you think your top three would be? Well, I would say that I, I started valuing those things a lot. It, it, and, and that's what sent me on the path to, to being the career. So if, if we go back further, the thing that was most important to me was the opportunity to help. That was, yep. that, that, that was, that was what was primary, like, like thinking of, you know, initial, you know, I taught for 13 years. So like I would say probably for the first 10 years of teaching, I just wanted to help students. 
And, you know, I still help students. I, I'm, I'm a volunteer uh, football coach on the high school football team that I was involved in before. Like I, I help run our technology department. So like, I'm still doing those like, like student helping type things, but, and I coach youth sports, uh, you know, with my, with my children. Um, I'm, I'm a volunteer coach there too. So like, like there's other outlets for those same things to occur, but you know, it is the flexibility. Cause like I'm working for an all remote company, um, yep. hub staff, and, and we've been all remote since 2012. Like that was a primary thing that I wanted to, you know, you know get after and, and, and achieve and, and have as a part of my working day is being able to, you know, wake up and, and cook breakfast for my children and have, have already worked 90 minutes before we did that and greet them off the bus or go pick them up or, you know, those sorts of things that, that wouldn't be possible in a, you know, teaching job or in a regular nine to five. So, yep. um, yeah, no, it's, it's Tyler. It's such a great example. I think many of the folks on this call uh, probably can connect with that. Like over the course of time, what we want out of our job can change. Yet, are we always able to sit down there and really characterize what's most important for us? And do we often know? So this is a simple exercise that where we're at today might not have been where we were six months ago when we didn't have a pandemic way of living, nor might it be where we are three months from now. And to your experience, I think you realize in your work that the flexibility to pursue things that you like, as well as the ways to use more skills that you have and to help you get compensated more, have risen to the top. And some of that meaningfulness that you get out of your time can come from other aspects. And I, I think it's such a perfect example of saying we learn along the way. And what we're going through allows us to see greater fulfillment, even if some of those aspects might not be part of the work that we do. So thank yeah. you, Tyler. That was a really yeah, good you're welcome. I, th th that's even my little personal like, like uh, thing that I put on LinkedIn posts is, is learning out loud, right? That's my little hashtag or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, you're, we're rhyming hard, yep. Josh. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a great example. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate you participating. Yep. So I'm going to keep us going to stay on time. I want to make sure that we have the opportunity to get some of these principles in life. So anyone that's leading teams, and I'll give the translation to the external, not just the you, but the, the other. So team leading or customer leading. Think about how this might come to life. And one of my favorite exercises to do in a more drawn out, likely in-person situation, though you can do it remote as well. Compare one person versus another, right? So if you're leading a team of 10 people, 20 people, do you truly understand as a leader how individuals might rank and file each one of these? Maybe your gut says yes. Have we ever taken the time to really do it? And if we do, when we're dealing with situations like fully remote or um, different deliverables, furloughed situations, I know people go through account growth, account decline, all of these things, understanding what might drive an individual what they might say makes them most satisfied in their work allows us to better customize that experience. On the flip side, I always bring up that one, what's your bottom one? Because I would argue many of us couldn't guess what that team member that we're leading actually might say is the least important thing. And if it's the most important thing for us and least important thing for us, we might have a bias in terms of how we're developing those skills and helping drive that performance. The flip side of that equation is think about the customers that we serve. Someone's recently sold a new program or a new software to someone and that's being implemented. Do we understand what drives that individual to be most satisfied with their work, right? If we did, maybe we could help ramp that program or that offering that we gave them and we can better understand how they're dealing with significant change that we're all going through today. So this works not just to understand self and how we get through it, but how to understand others might be getting through difficult challenges. And so I recommend doing this on an ongoing basis. It's fun to watch different teams, especially when people work together, actually see different opinions on what might matter more to them. So if, as I shared, if you are someone that doesn't believe satisfaction leads to greater productivity in your work, there's also the idea of dissatisfaction, which I do think is a big one. So when we think about dissatisfaction, there's an easy way to look at it in terms of what happens when someone's gas tank of satisfaction isn't all the way full, right? There's a couple actions that take place. So for me, when I've been dissatisfied with my work, I'm someone that clearly is never at a loss for words, and I'm probably more proactive than many. So I often voice my issue. I don't believe that this is operating right. I feel like we, if we did X, it could be better, right? Don't critique unless you can provide an improvement. At the same time, that is not the normal behavior. Some people might still be constructive and just believe things are gonna get better. I know we're in a rough spot as a business. I know we're in a rough spot as a team. I know I'm in a rough spot as a person. I just believe things are going to get better, right? It's a belief in the system and the people around us that trust often creates. But there's the other side. 
I don't know if anyone has gone through this experience, but you've been so unhappy with your work, you leave, right? Has anyone quit a job? <laughs> Whether it's dramatic or even something as simple as find something else. I would argue you found something else because the things that were more important to you to create satisfaction, they were outweighed at whatever that something else was. And the one that eats me as a leader and as a professional is when all of a sudden the situation and you get so little value in what you're doing it, you simply neglect the work because that impacts everyone else. At least if you leave, well, you can be replaced with someone that maybe gets more satisfaction on the role. But neglect, which happens pretty frequently when maybe you're seeing a peer or a partner or a leader not putting enough in, maybe because there's not enough satisfaction in the work. So understanding what makes us best and makes our team best and makes our customers operate in terms of what do they like about their work helps us to understand, can we help them get more out of it and in turn often help us get more out of it. So as we transition to motivation, and I will stop to look at some of the chat questions, but as we transition to motivation, right? Job satisfaction, simply a view in terms of characteristics of what make you satisfied. That's different than what drives you to do something. So a simple way to look at motivation is extrinsic and intrinsic, right? Do I get value when someone gives me my bonus check or my commission check? This is not right or wrong. None of this is right or wrong. This is self-understanding. Or is it more important that I get to work with people that I gravitate towards, right? My example, historically, I would have said, Josh is fueled by money. Pay me more, I'm going to do it. Yet I don't have many steps along my way from my first job out of school when I took a third less because it was something I wanted to do, right? I am fueled by things that are more internal. I want to give back in a lot of ways. Right or wrong, not important in this case, but understanding self is. So I want to give you an example of how this might come to life. So theory, Douglas McGregor is the theorist, and I liked basic theories, came up in the 50s and 60s, way before many of our time, right? The two theories of XY basically look from a manager to an associate. So I ask you as leaders, or I ask you as an associate, a theory X manager might say, I don't believe my people want to come to work, right? People come to work to get paid. People come to work to have the dollars to do what they need to do. Theory X argues, I need to stay on that associate to make sure I get the most out of them because by nature, they're waking up going, I have to be here somewhere nine to five and that's okay. Once again, just doing a job, there's nothing wrong with that. You could have utmost satisfaction just doing your gig. But as a manager, if you look to your folks to say, I don't know if they wanna be here, you're essentially arguing on the Theory X side. Now, Theory Y is the other end of the spectrum. I believe people look at work and what they need to deliver no different than they might look at something fun to do or eating breakfast, or uh, something that makes them fulfilled, right? Theory wise on the other side. So I ask you as an individual, where would you rank yourself on that scale of one to 10, right? Are you closer to a why? I believe I never have to do anything with the people I lead, or I don't need anyone above me telling me what to do, because I want to be here more than anything else. This gives me fulfillment. Or are you on the other side of that spectrum to go, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just doing a gig. It's helpful to have a boss give me direction. It's helpful for a boss to give me feedback on why this isn't working or why this is. Because this makes a difference for how we attain that level of satisfaction, right? Like at the end of the day, these things are connected. So this theory for me is a great practice to say as an individual, how do we look at work? Or am I closer to someone to say, I have to go to work today? Or am I closer to someone that said, there's nothing I'd rather do than work today? As a leader, do we look at our teams and say, at the end of the day, I don't know if they want to be here. Or do we look at them saying, there's nothing they'd rather do. And if we're dealing with customers and we're trying to help them get the most out of whatever our relationship might be, do we believe they want to do their gig? Or do they have to do their gig? Those questions are important considerations when we say, how do we use change moments, right? This is all about self-respect. If something different is happening, yet if we understand self and what we get happiness out of our role, regardless of change, that allows us to do something with it. So consider that one, considering time move a little forward, but it's a great exercise. So I wanna bring this back to the concept of change and I'll take some overall questions as we go forward. So if you are like me, when you hear change management, you get this um, technical medical feeling of like, right? You hear someone is doing something to you. For me, when I've heard change management, it's always someone way above me, the gods of a business saying, this is what needs to take place. And in many ways it's true. Yet at the same time, if we look at true change management principles, and I'm highlighting one here, and we said, could we use it as individuals for what we're going through, challenges that we might be uh, um, encountering, 
that cause us to do something different. And that's a great workshop exercise to actually lay out. So, right, we have to deal with something. How do we get through? Can we use what businesses often do to implement something within an organization to help us implement something that gets us back to good? John Connor, uh, John Cotter, a theorist about this eight part plan, eight step plan. I'm gonna break this down into three different components. So the first component is really, how do we break from the status quo? And I ask each of you to think. So if you're still using a notepad, if you are using the chat functionality, I want you to think through this example. So the three components that exist first, a sense of urgency, right? So we're thinking about what we're going through. How do we use the reality that we need to get it done now? a compelling reason to move forward. So if it is, go back to Daryl's example of a new, a new job. I'm starting today. There's no better time to accomplish what I want to out of this role because it's exciting and it's now. So I need to establish, I can't wait three weeks because I'd be three weeks into the job. The reality is today's the day. So how do we create a compelling reason? I have no choice but to be great. I want to leave a great first impression. So establish a sense of urgency. Number two, who do I need to help? They're all highlighted at the end of the day. What I like is the people around me to help me go uh, through this anxiety of something new in a positive way. So how do we bring those people within our circle to help us deal with this new thing that we're dealing with, right? Create a new vision. I would argue from a business standpoint, an organizational standpoint, this is what I think most businesses do well with dealing with change. Here's the big idea of what we're bringing up. Here's what we want to be. But I'd argue you often skip out on are all the people involved with making that decision there, that coalition you need. And have we established a sense of urgency to move us forward? So great exercise when we're helping our teams become something new. How do we establish that sense of urgency? How do we bring people together so you have the right resources to ensure it's going to last and it's going to have an impact? And what is that vision that we can hearken back to? So when I said those eight steps are really broken into three areas, how do we break where we're at today, knowing we have to be somewhere tomorrow? This is the first step in that process. The second step, how do we cause movement? How do we move from here to here? How do we get there? Communication, right? So if I'm, if I'm we'll, we'll switch over to Tyler's example. New role, right? How do I communicate to all those people that I care about that this is what I'm doing, right? So everything I'm talking about, I want to be that technical educator. I think I said that right, Tyler. I know you're back on mute or uh, yes, but you get where I'm going with that case. How do we communicate to everyone? And how do we communicate to those people with our, our organization, our circle, that I now have the flexibility to coach other sports? That's important to me. That fulfillment, I don't need to get from my primary work. I can get outside of my work. I would argue that's an example of communication and empower others to act upon this, right? So if we're in a leadership role, how do we ensure that we break down those barriers so this individual can accomplish what they need to? This also works when we're helping customers. We've sold a new program. Customers implementing it. Everyone's remote, pandemic environment. Everyone's pulling back dollars. How do I help you, customer, break down those dynamics so you can still accomplish what you want? Because you want to be the person that gets the credit for bringing the new thing, right? Tie it all back to job satisfaction. Last component of this, right? We started with how do we break norm? How do we cause movement? And at the end component of it, how do we reset? And this is when it comes to life, the last component. How do we reward short-term wins? So if it's a new job, when something goes well, when I get a moment of appreciation, when I get that first paycheck or that first commission check, how do I honor it, right? Or we're leading teams. How do we recognize that person that went through a change and help deal with where we need to be, help reset it so we show the behaviors that are important? How do we highlight to a customer that is just implementing something? This is awesome. You made it to the first milestone. Reinforce that component. And then the consolidation step. How do we... Notice what didn't go right and highlight what did. Wow, this change of job, change of career really gave me a lot of this stuff that I wanted, but I still feel like I don't have enough autonomy yet. Am I going to get that at this position? Is it a time equation? Autonomy is important for me. Or do really I have to think a little bit differently about what is the right position for me, right? How do we consolidate what we see, reassess where we might need to go? And the last component, reinforcement, right? This is the new norm, so it has to be part of everyday behavior. So what I tried to do here, and once again, in a full session, we would break down this to individual examples, but to take true change management principles that businesses take to implement a different way of acting, but don't apply them to the organization, apply them to ourselves. That's an important part of this. So I'm going to do two things here, and Sansa, you can um, 
hop back on. So we attempted to cover here dealing with change, job satisfaction, motivation, how to drive personal change. I hope that everyone got at least an example or two that they could do with themselves, their teams, or their customers to better understand how we get through anything that we're dealing with. And we are right on time, Sansi, for that last 45 minutes of question. Awesome. So do we want, uh, and do you want to actually lead the Q&A or do you want to go, do you want me to go through the chat? Yeah, maybe we can co-host it, but I saw some things come up from the chat. Actually, one of them was my own question. Um, uh, and that was around dealing with change fatigue. So there's a lot of change going on. It feels like more now than ever, uh, but maybe that is or isn't true. Could just be my own experience. Uh, yep. So, you know, how do you, what is your, what are your thoughts on rallying continue to rally uh when change just feels like it's constantly coming down from a personal team customer perspective any any tips yeah so i think part of what we're talking about in this case is right there's certain words that have always come up over my experience that eventually stop having meaning everyone says strategic right like that concept in itself everyone says we're dealing with change part of what we're sharing here is to simply say everything is always going to be different and to not focus on it, but to instead focus on the reality of where we get the most value as an individual that seeks our own level of satisfaction. So when we deal with something that's uncomfortable, we've already put some of the tools in place to say, I know who I am. I know what's important to the other person that's dealing with this situation. How do I focus on that? Knowing that today is not going to be the same as tomorrow and tomorrow is not the same as yesterday. So that would be part of stop focusing solely on this is constantly happening and realize it is gonna constantly happen. The mm -hmm. reality is how do we better understand what we want out of it and focus on that regardless of the waves of change. And I think that's often been the best way that I've heard from best practices, to not focus on any one moment, but focus on those moments are always happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw a question come in to me privately too that I'll voice while people are thinking if they have any thoughts to share or questions around, again, from a personal, from a management, or from a customer perspective. Um, how, do, with individuals, I've had individuals on my team, for better or for worse, um, that have just seemed to be hugely resistant to change in general. It's difficult for them. Um, now, I didn't have a lot of these things as a playbook to help me through that. So I feel like now I have sort of been shepherded through that process. Um, but do you find that there are just certain individuals, regardless of the eight steps, that just are incredibly resistant and do you have any thoughts around um how to sort of help them through that or is it or do you sometimes get to a point where you think okay just some people it's very difficult for them i would argue if you go back to that slide that we kind of went through a little bit quickly but the resistance to change on the personal end i would argue the one that often comes up most is just the idea of habit like we all form habits that just become second nature to us so when we're talking about the work that we do the thing that we're doing over and over becomes easier for us to do because of the nature of getting repetitive about it. Most change causes us to do something differently. So part of partially thinking about job satisfaction breaks away the routine of what you need to do, right? It's no longer about action A, it's about you as an individual. So when all of a sudden we can get away from the thing that you want to do over and over, we can focus on what do you actually want from your role? Example, if at the end of the day, compensation is the most important thing for you, that's great because I know how great you've been at the thing that you've been doing in the past that you just want to mm -hmm. do over and over again. And at the end yeah. of the day, you're doing that because you want to get compensated. I've found there's an opportunity that if you can do this at the same level you were doing it before, it's actually going to benefit you in terms of the compensation that you make. So mm -hmm. now we've broken away from that habit and that routine that you want to do because it's easier, it's safer, it's more comfortable. And we moved into a situation of how do I get you more satisfaction in what you're doing? If that is a layer and you can do this through any of someone's top things that might matter to them. Mm -hmm. Does that help, mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. I wonder if we can give Andrew, I, I think you're, you're still on, Andrew Marks, um, you made a comment, maybe uh, Josh, you could give him the floor for a bit of time where you talked about the importance of what's in it for me. Uh, maybe talk us a little bit through that. Have you used that yourself in the past, um, sort of how that manifests as part of your process? So let's see. I think, uh, Sansi, since I have, I've sent it back over to you as host, if you want to go to participants and highlight Andrew, you can unmute him. All right, cool. Let's do that. There you go, Andrew. Hey. Hey there. Hey. Thanks for putting this together. Sorry I was a little late. All no, good. Um, 
Yeah. So we, we actually, we, we teach a lot about, about change management um, to folks in customer success. And, and, and I, and I love, I love Josh, what you had to say about that. I mean, from a, from a personal perspective, something that's really important and something that we teach customer success managers how to do, you know, because you, you don't, you don't drive adoption by teaching people, you know, feature function, how to use a product. Uh, They're, they're making a change. Uh, A really important step that a lot of people miss is, is clearly laying out what's in it for them, right? You yep. talked about how, oh, there's this, you know, edict brought down from the top of the organization about this change we're making because it's going to be great for the organization. And, and that's great and all, but you really can't get buy-in unless you're really clear about what's in it for the individual. And, and I think when you're, when you're doing that also for yourself is you need to be honest with yourself and say to yourself, hey, what, what am I going to get out of this? What, yep. what am I and and and, I, and the components that you put together, you kind of build that. But I think going into kind of assembling that, you want to think about that from yeah from from your perspective, right? Yep. Just, so just like when we're when we're trying to drive adoption, we're trying to drive change, we're trying to support our customer. If we want to take their perspective, but don't forget to take uh, your mm-hmm. own perspective. I know that sounds it's it it sounds silly, but I think we forget to to sit back and say to ourselves, okay, what is this really going to do for me? Yep. Mm. I think it's such a great point. I would argue what I've loved about what I've learned about customer success and why this fundamentally was built with customer sex, uh, success in mind is at the end of the day, customer success done right, you're on the same side of the table as a customer. Like my job is to help you accomplish what you want based upon the thing that you've signed on for that you've asked us to do. But I think the extra layer that's a little bit different than understanding what makes me satisfied in my work is what is going to make you satisfied with this thing that we're implementing, that we're driving, that we're trying to make you realize the utmost realization, right? Yeah. That idea is important. And to your point, I can think about the work that I've been lucky enough as a, as a marketer to often build a lot of my programs from the ground up, something that I gravitate towards as an individual. But when folks have asked me, like, what do you want out of it? It's often, I want to work with a lot of other people that sit across functions that help me learn more. Like, that's what I'm interested in. That is still different than what's the outcome of the thing I'm launching. Right. And I think you're getting at the same idea, like is at the end of the day, you implementing this fully, is it about recognition that you get from your management? Is it about you moving on to the next thing that you get to implement? Something that would probably drive me as an individual. Is it about you owning this thing in its entirety? Those three different answers that I just made up on the spot that are all likely stuff that we've experienced could probably change the way that you help this individual. Yeah, right? for sure. So, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Really good point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you, Andrew, and thanks for joining today. It's good to it's good to hear your voice. <laughs> yeah, of course. We, we need to we need to we need to connect again and talk. Totally, totally. Catch up. Do it. That'd be great. Um, Erica, if you're, I, I think you're still here with us on the call. I'm curious to know. You mentioned a little bit earlier in the chat. You talked about having a conversation around this with one of your managers, um, getting an understanding of what motivates her team. Um, Curious to understand, of course, not oversharing, but how did how did that conversation play out? How does this some of this manifest in actuality when you're having this one-on-one conversation? So I'm going to give you the floor if you would feel comfortable sharing a little bit about that. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, yeah. So uh, so this conversation came up just yesterday. Actually, I was um, going through sort of a, a mid-year review with one of my managers and um, she's a a first time manager and she has about five folks under her now. She's super talented, super motivated. Um, You know, one of these really sort of high velocity individuals Um, and not everyone, she does, uh, she does a better job at motivating folks who are more like her than are unlike her. And she can, um, tend to struggle with folks who maybe aren't as, um, I don't know if type A is the word, I kind of hate that designation, but, um, you know, oftentimes she's on like step eight when everyone else is on step four and maybe a little, you know, uh, you know, just kind of gets ahead of herself. So anyway, we had a conversation around trying to figure out, you know, there are different types of people and what, what motivates them exactly what we were going through with the exercise, what's most important to them. And for some folks, it's, you know, they might prioritize, um, you know, certain relationships or they might 
um, need to get a lot of validation. And so we just talked about trying to individualize the, the motivation and how she motivates some of the folks on her team um, just so it's, it's more aligned with, well, with, with the individual. And so, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's how that conversation came up just within a um, coaching a coach context, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do think it's a great point. There's a couple examples that just pop up. So you go from that strong individual performer to leader, right? That in itself is the amount of research about that transition, regardless of role, is an important one because what makes you great as an individual contributor is often not the same thing that makes you great as a leader. And that's just the reality of it. Now, you can be both, but it often causes you to think a little bit differently. I do think the same concept of saying, help me understand this has worked for me with the folks that I've followed or that I've worked for. Right? How do I understand what's most important to you doing this role? I love asking that question as a leader, and it's often easier to ask your own team than it is to ask up. But it's an opportunity to learn what's most important to potentially say, okay, the reality is I need to find a way to get what I value most based upon this thing that this person above me cares for. But at the end of the day, um, general, speaking in generalities, let's say this individual wants to maintain high performance as an individual now as a leader, though. My team needs to be the best. You yeah. referencing someone jumping to step eight before everyone else is there tells me that's probably part of it. I could be completely wrong, but I can see that story. So I know at the end of the day, recognition and performance above matters most for this individual. So if really what I want is to work well with others and learn new things. How do I take that opportunity? If we learn these things, we're probably going to achieve this top of the performance in terms of our, uh, every other team that's doing this thing. That can be one way to transform it. Part of my favorite things I've done when I've been in leadership roles and I have teams is to simply ask over the next 30 days, what would make you most happy in the work that you do? Because every time I do this and I think I'm relatively intuitive to understand what people want, I have never been right. <laughs> my gut reaction is never accurate for anyone. And, and to simply ask that in a safe environment, it's so telling what people are willing to share. And it's amazing how off our own perception can actually be. Absolutely. And asking above you is an important thing to do because at least it allows you to say, if I can't get what I need out of this individual, I at least know what they need. Now, how do I ladder up to that to make myself more fulfilled? Mm. Does that help, Erica? For sure, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's awesome. I, I think what really stuck with me, especially at the end there, was the importance of asking. Uh, I think many of us feel like we have a crystal ball type understanding or, you know, we're very intuitive, especially if we're in CS, like we feel that we're high on the EQ scale. But um, it's really important just to ask, open up the floor and and have that conversation because uh, you might not be correct and then you're making assumptions that really are based in the reality of the person that you're speaking with again whether it's a team member or whether it's a customer so um i think we're going to close on that note uh thank you so much everyone for joining us today um our group humans of customer success our topics are really focused around uh relationships and that component of uh, how we interact with our customers, whether high scale, you know, working with SMB, mid market or enterprise level customers. Thank you, Josh, so much for joining us. I love this session. I think this is my third time listening to it and it's, <laughs> I always get something new. Um, so thank you so much again, everyone else for joining. I hope you have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. We'll share this. Of course, it's recorded after the fact, so feel free. Um, I hope you got something out of it. We will follow up though and ask and make sure and not assume <laughs> and get your and thoughts. So to, to that point, I know it's within the deck as well, but if there's anyone that has any follow-up questions or any thoughts, I'm happy to take it. This is part of what I do. So if you'd like to continue the dialogue, please feel, re feel free to reach out to me as well. Thank you for letting me be a part of this great group. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josh, so much. And we'll talk to you uh, next, uh, next month. <laughs> See ya. Awesome.